never take a job you know you can do. You know, you should always have this pit in your stomach thinking, oh my God, holy cow, how am I ever going to do that? That almost like shaking a butterflies as you open the door for the first day, because that's really how you grow. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm doing that even today in, in my latest in, um, venture, because it's all brand new to me. So that's one. Um, a second is there is no one playbook. So there isn't one way to do things. And so listening to lots of people, getting lots of ideas, and then with a set of principles for how you make decisions, coming up with with the right strategy is important, but recognizing that there isn't one playbook and and doing a lot of listening. Um, And third would probably be living, you know, set out what your principles are in a company, in an organization, and as you individually, and make sure that you're living living by those, because that's how you lead with your heart. Mm. Hello, and welcome to Anatomy of a Leader show with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of HVO Search. Founders, CEOs, and lone HR directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life, the failures they faced, what they wish they knew before they started, and the hurdles they had to overcome. If you want to be inspired, surprised, and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top, you're in the right place here on Anatomy of a Leader. Like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will change the way you think and may even change your life. Today on Anatomy of a Leader, episode 13, we're doing a live conversation with a very special guest who I have known for many years, Miriam Lahage. Miriam is an entrepreneur, NED, and advisor to early stage companies. She has spent her career growing businesses such as eBay, Fig Leaves, Navabi, and Netaporta. Miriam's expertise is at the juncture of fashion, consumers, and technology. She helped create the voice for the $9.7 billion eBay fashion business as VP Global Head of Fashion. Nobody can drive innovation like Miriam, and this is one of the reasons she co-founded Equip, a technology startup building a behavioral analytics platform that measures the unseen but very important factors that shape how people feel and perform to determine healthy work life, inclusion, and productivity. And I'm very excited to speak with her today. Miriam, hello. Welcome to the show and welcome to my home. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be here. I've been trying to get you to come for some time because you are my neighbor and we literally live around the corner from each other. And I've known you for years and just, I, I find you like such an incredible, very warm, very passionate person that's just so knowledgeable and just amazing with people and just want to kind of talk about your story and get to know you a little bit better and for our listeners and viewers to get to know you a bit as well in terms of all the incredible work that you've been doing. Um, So yeah, I mean, one of the companies that you have co-founded not so long ago is called Equip Mm -hmm. and you know, having come from, you know, predominantly sort of a fashion background and e-commerce background, what what kind of prompted you to co-found this company and, and why this business? So I think you get to a point in your career where you determine that there are things that you love to do. There are things that um, people will pay you to do and there are things that the world needs and, and figuring out where the intersection um, is where, I, where I've been. And I had spent a lot of time learning how to be a better leader myself and how to help others to be better leaders and to create a culture that where everyone can feel like they can thrive. And I got to a point where I realized I don't want to do this just for one company. Mm. I want to think about how I can make a bigger impact and what are the structural Um, elements that cause us to create workplaces where 
only some people feel like they can thrive and only some people feel like they can take on a leadership role, which is how I got involved with my co-founder, Michael Vela, who was at an incubator um, startup focused on um, social impact businesses. And between us, we started Equip. We had another co-founder, um, Patrick, join us as CTO and started to build the business on the notion that um, using behavioral science and data science, you can help companies to measure um, and then pr improve and then measure again um, workplace well-being, workplace cultural norms to help for everybody to thrive at work. Mm, amazing. Yeah. And in terms of Equip, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what, what is involved? What do you do and you know, what do you measure? So there are a couple of different things that we measure. If you think about um, the survey work or engagement surveys that are out there, often they ask people how they're feeling. Um, and that's all important and all, and all great to do. But we took a different tack. We really looked at interpersonal relationships, and we wanted to understand how people were behaving and how they were experiencing um, the business. So the focus is very much on the interpersonal workings, the workings between people, um, to help to identify um, the things that are most important in creating um, the best culture in a company. And, you know, core to that is really psychological safety, mm -hmm. making sure that people feel comfortable, they, that they can have an idea or that they can say that maybe they don't understand something and they need to learn more without fear of ridicule and without fear of diminishing, being diminished by the company. And so with that core thought of psychological safety and behavioral science, um, we developed a platform that allows us to measure behaviors, measure the different facets um, that are most important in terms of organizational health, and then help companies to implement behavioral nudges in order to help people along to do the right thing. Often they're very simple things that you can do, but they're not necessarily the things that you would automatically think of doing. And so that's such what as, Such as what? Like, can you give us an example? Um, so for example, I mean, this, seem, this seems silly, but um, you know, one nudge is that before you um, jump into working together to find out what's important to each other. And so setting up structured one-to-ones between team members as, as they get to know each other so they can understand what's important in their lives. Mm. Well, what are the institutions that are important? What are they afraid of? What are they hoping for the future? And something as simple as a um, light touch structured one-to-one -one actually helps for um, individuals create a meaningful connection and really be present with each other. So when there is work to do and when the necessary conflicts arise because there's always going to be creative conflict when you're working together. Um, they're much more able to get through that because they've started to develop a relationship. That's fascinating. It's almost like some people do this already naturally. It, you don't even need to kind of prompt them or nudge them, as you say. It just sort of you know naturally happens within an environment. And what I find fascinating is distilling what those behaviors are of you know great leaders or you know. Um, individuals who actually you know drive change within a business and organization and actually make it healthy as you said and i just find that fascinating that you know how you can sort of distill those those behaviors um so what we've done is really um gone back to the science so we um have a phd in behavioral science um who's actually an organizational psychologist by training um, and is focused on loving personal relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're grounded in the survey data that is um, already out there and already validated. So very evidence-based. Um, he would he helped us with a team that worked with him of other behavioral sciences scientists to create the nudges um, that are proven to work. And so um, it's there are things that are very intuitive and you figure, well, of course, this is going to work. But then to find out that there are things that actually have evidence that has worked in many different locations in many different contexts um, is really important to give people a little bit of bravery to try something new out. Do you have some companies that you work with that resist this? Or, you know, obviously having the, the science backing saying, look, this actually works. Do any companies resist 
or they just don't sort of end up working with you in the first place? Um, I, certainly not every company that we approach uh, ends up working with us, and, and it takes a certain leap um, for companies to be interested in um, doing something like this. I would say that I would liken it to when, you know, last summer when the world was first talking about racism, mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of talk about, well, I'm... I'm not a racist, therefore I'm fine. And it's actually not that, it's that the structure is in place, um, that it's not fair to everyone. And so helping companies to see that this isn't a judgment on them, but what do you have, what are the structures that are in place that may not be f feel fair to everybody? And so rather than it, um, it being a reflection on you, if you don't get triple high marks, Rather, it's opportunities for you to figure out how you can improve your company and make it that much better. So we talk about leadership on, on the show mm -hmm. and through your work. I mean, what, what are the main qualities that come up for, you know, a great leader? Um, I guess for me, it's probably three things. It's being able to set a vision. So have really a clear vision in your mind of something that you um, think the company can achieve, and it's probably beyond um, what everyone would expect. So it should be a North Star. It should be hard to get to. And then being able to create clarity for everyone of what that vision is, and then helping ordinary people do extraordinary things. It's that collaborative process and um, being able to invite people into the conversation um, and not feel that that diminishes you as a leader, rather than it enhances you as a leader mm -hmm. to, to bring people along. I think those are the, mm -hmm. the qualities that mm -hmm. great leadership needs. A lot of the conversations that I have, we talk about vision and also dealing with uncertainty. And I feel like the creating of the vision and making it really clear is what provides that certainty to the team, because, you know, you always, even if you're not in a startup where things are constantly shifting, I mean, an organization is always, you know, trying things or, you know, trying to figure it out. So yeah, setting that vision is just so, so key. Who were some of the great leaders that you've worked with or what have you learned from them? Um, so Ted English was my CEO at TJX. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I worked with him a couple of different times. And um, as I was rising up the ranks, and he was rising up the ranks to CEO. And, you know, he showed great vision. He, he also showed a great empathy for the customer and for the employee. And I thought that that was, that was key. Um, and he, he really proved himself at um, an incredibly difficult time. So we, you, you may not have known, but I was at TJX, um, and we suffered a loss of seven of our employees, um, our colleagues who were all in the fashion, in the women's fashion area, died on one of the planes, and at 9/11 that that went into the World Trade Center, and he was there to steer the ship. He was there to continue to bring this organization forward at a time of incredible crisis and crisis for um, the country and obviously for the company. And he did it with such grace um, at the same time that he paid attention to all, all, the, all the business elements. He paid attention to the human elements as well. And that leading from the heart um, is something that I really learned from him. And it really comes across from you as well, because you're such a genuine person. And when you, you know, how you're leading the teams and how you treat everyone, I feel like that kind of shows in all of the, all of your interaction. So it's, it's interesting how the work that you're doing with Equip now is actually focusing on those kind of like interpersonal interactions between individuals mm -hmm. and how you're really following your heart there. I, th I think you're right. I think that there's a journey there. And, and mm. I, you know, I humbly say, though, that even though I might, as a leader, treat everyone the same, I recognize that there, with power comes responsibility. Now I sound like Spider-Man. Um, and, and because of that, I need to recognize that my words come across differently because I'm the CEO of a company, for example. 
Um, and so recognizing that there are structural hierarchical things in a company, whether you brought them there or not, um, it's just, it's in the water, it's in the air we breathe. And so recognizing that and figuring out what it is that you need to do to make it psychologically safe for everyone to speak up, I think is, is something that I've had to learn over time, um, but I, I continue to learn and I continue to work on that. Touching on psychological safety, what what does that mean? I mean, and how do you know that you have it? Um, so psychological safety as, as defined, um, and Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School is the person who's brought it into the vernacular more than anyone else, is feeling safe enough at work so that you are willing to have an idea or admit to a failure or admit to something that you don't know without fear of retribution. And so that seems pretty simple. Um, and what's, what's interesting is that it's not necessarily about what the person in power does. It's more how the person who's not in power feels about it. And so there, you know, I couldn't possibly as a CEO tell you if somebody in my organization was psychologically safe just because I want them to be. So it's not intent, it's really impact. And so teasing out what the impact is, um, I think is the tricky part. And it's why um, people with best intentions um, who are trying to do all the right things can sometimes miss the mark because they don't recognize, for example, that the power of their words because they're at a higher level um, is different than someone else's words. Mm. I find that I find that fascinating. And of the work of Amy Edmondson in particular, I think, you know, it's 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 amazing to see how that's being applied in in organizations. And looking back into the companies that you worked with, I mean, you talk about TJX, you know, you worked for, you know, for eBay. Navabi, Kudos, I think as well. Mm -hmm. Which of those, or where did you feel you, you were psychologically safe at the most? What, was it there? Was it even thought about at the time? This sounds awful, but I, the higher I went, the, um, the less psychologically safe I was because um, everybody has a boss. And, you know, in a way, um, when you become a leader, so you know when I w when I had two hundred people working for me, for example at eBay or the whole team working for me as CEO at Kudos or at um, Fig Leaves, I had the the burden of knowing that that. I needed to be a great steward for the business. And so there is this feeling, and it all comes back to confidence and imposter syndrome and all of those things that we um, that swirl around our brains when we're trying to make the right decision. Um, and so it made me feel like I couldn't make a mistake. And, and obviously, if you can't make a mistake, then you can't take risks. If you can't take risks, then you're not going to be able to make amazing things happen. So it's probably an internal struggle, regardless of where I've been, which is why I'm so in tune to it now. Mm. And when did you recognize that you, you, you were saying that you, the higher up you went, the more, the less psychologically safe you were feeling. Yeah. Was there a point where you re recognized it's like, oh, you know, I have an imposter syndrome or I feel less confident or actually every decision that I make and, you know, kind of the stakes get higher as well as you get further up the ladder. Um, so, I mean, wh at which point did you think actually, you know, feel like less confident here? I think it was probably in my first startup, my first CEO startup role, and another startup CEO who was further along um, and had been doing it for a while longer. And he said to me, um, being CEO is, a is the loneliest job. And that's why we need to connect to each other and, you know, increase our network and be there for each other. And I, you know, I think that was 15 years ago. I think of it even now. And I, you know, I spoke to him recently. It's that recognition that the buck stops with you mm -hmm. um, suddenly makes you feel like you need to be putting on that um, um, face of all-knowing, all-powerful, we will figure out every problem that we have. And recognizing that sometimes you miss the mark and sometimes you do what you think is the right thing and it's not and you need to take ownership for that and move on. And I have to say, 
getting to that place where um, you can have that humility is so powerful. And actually, it's such a relief. Mm -hmm. um, it, it allows you to put more energy into your work rather than worrying and looking over your shoulder that you're not doing everything perfectly. Mm. And when did you stop doing that? Like when you were like, you know what, you know, I recognize that, you know, mistakes will happen. And, you know, even though the buck stops with me still having to make those decisions, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. I think that's one of the wonderful things that failure brings on. You know, every little failure helps you to figure out okay, that didn't kill me. I picked myself <laughs> right. I picked yeah. myself up. I dusted myself off. We figured out a way to do it. We injected some humor and we moved forward. No lives were lost. Um, and it's only, you know, we used to say it's only dresses or it's only swimwear. You know, mm -hmm. how bad could it be? Um, and once you go through enough of those, you start to develop the resilience that you need mm -hmm. um, in order to live through them. What's been a mistake that kind of you still think about? that you've made? Wow, how long do we have? <laughs> um, so I, I guess the, the mistake that I've made a couple of different times, and I will probably make it again, is particularly in um, when you're in a, in a position of transformation, you're transforming the technology, or you're transforming the customer offering, or you're transforming the merchandise. Um, it's easy to convince yourself that you've got product market fit right, that you have it right, and now's the time you're going to spend lots of marketing money and go after the customer. And in reality, you're always convincing yourself. You're always rationalizing that you're there before you're there. Um, and sometimes you figure out a way to get there, and it's easy, but sometimes it, it can cost you a lot of um, time and money and brand reputation if you try to get out there too quickly. So that's something that I seem to have continued to. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a mistake I continue to make in different forms, um, but I'm trying to get better at that. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a matter of the mistakes themselves, but also the lessons that you take away from them. And as you said, they take in different forms, so they're not always obvious or you know. Yeah, I think that's that's a fascinating way to look at it. And what do you feel most proud of? Um, I, I guess the as I think about the career the career that I've had, because most of it has been fairly commercial. And now while this is a commercial startup, it's meant to do good in the world. It's meant to have a social impact. I'm really proud that um, you know, pretty much everyone in my family has some social impact component in their work. Um, and it, it isn't like we just we had a family meeting and decided we were going to do this. It just sort of happened. Um, and I'm really proud of that. And I'm proud of the way we've um, we've operated in this world. Mm. It's a good thing. Actually, let's let's take it back. Like we're talking about the things that you've been sort of doing most recently. But tell me about the time. Tell me about when you were growing up. So I was the grandchild of immigrants. My, um, my dad's parents came from Lebanon and my mom's parents came from Ireland to the US. I grew up in Boston, outside of Boston. And my family had a collection of restaurants along um, Nantasket Beach, which is like Brighton Beach, but tackier. So hard to imagine <laughs> being tackier than Brighton Beach, but it was definitely a couple mm -hmm. of steps below that. Um, and I worked in the restaurants from the time I was 12. So when I was 12, I would waitress. Um, and then when I was 14, I would um, do the double entry bookkeeping. I would do the payroll. I would count the money. Um, I would do the equivalent of the VAT um, tax. Um, all of, I would take all of the invoices, um, pay the invoices, and then figure out what the gross margins were when the prices changed. So, you know, I was in, I was in basically a retail business mm -hmm. um, from the time I was 12, thinking about margin and the weather because it was very weather dependent because it was at the beach since I was 12 mm -hmm. years old. So when I went off to uni, I was going to business school. I was accepted to a business school in the Midwest. Um, and before I got there, I went in to shop at a local um, at a local small store, um, independent. And 
the woman who was running it was lovely, and I started chatting with her, and I ended up going back to see her the following day, um, and I ended up not going to business school and working for her, running her small shop and helping her open another one and buying for them as well. So I, I mean, talk about totally by accident. Um, I really wasn't meant to be in retail at all, but that's mm -hmm. how I got into it, and I loved fashion, and I ended up staying with it for a very long time and spent most of those years at TJX where I was for 21 and a half years um, and then got into the e-commerce space from that. Um, and from TJX came to London to launch a startup and I was staying for two years. Um, and here I am 16 years later and, mm -hmm. um, and still at it. Mm. How do you find being in London after, you know, having kind of, you know, been to different places and coming from the US and being here? So I've had this interesting checkered past where um, I've lived in London for 16 years, mm -hmm. um, but I've worked during that time. I worked in Silicon Valley when I was running eBay fashion. Um, I lived part time in Vienna and part time in Dusseldorf when I was working for Pieken Kloppenburg. I lived part-time in Aachen, Germany, which no one has heard of, but it is a lovely little silly <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was working for Navabi. So I, I've experienced um, London as a, as a home um, and as a place to work, but also have been able to see the cultural differences in business across those countries. And, you know, the wonderful thing about being from the U.S. is that people will give you a pass when you're too aggressive or you're um, too driven when you're in London, that if you were British, you wouldn't get to do those. And so I've been getting a pass for being American for a very long time. Wow, you know, all of these kind of cultural nuances that you have to pay attention to when you're going between places, and I totally get that. So must have been also... A culture shock, but also going to other European countries, there must be a different way of, of operating there as well and having to adjust. Did you find that there was more of a contrast there? Absolutely. There's mm. definitely um, a difference. And certainly for eBay was, was doing business um, primarily in France and in Germany. Um, but most, most of my life at, with continental Europe has found it to be um, more hierarchical even than British business. And um, you know, not necessarily willing to take risks um, commercially, and um, but lots of creativity that just needs to be unlocked. And so, one one of the things that I loved is um, helping organizations that are based in Berlin or Aachen or um, or Düsseldorf or Vienna to really come to be their best and to realize that. They can do extraordinary things and not just do what um, is directed for them from the top down, because I think it's a much more interesting way for people to work. Mm. You talked about unlocking creativity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, how do you do that? So first thing is to be psychologically safe. You knew I was going to say that, right? Indeed. Um, and, and understanding that everyone gets to be part of a part of the conversation um, and helping people to see that they matter and what the, um, the contributions that they um, contribute matter. Um, at Fig Leaves, one of the things that I did when I, when I went in was to run um, brainstorming sessions about what were the initiatives that we would go after. And it took a fair amount of time, but we got every single person who worked in the organization from the people in the warehouse to the people on, in, in um, customer care, to the buyers, to the technologists, thinking about different approaches that we could take and made it totally transparent for everyone to see. And, and just asking people for their ideas and then going and adding, um, acting on them and having them see them to fruition um, is incredibly empowering for, for folks and um, can unlock the creativity that's already there. It's just been hidden for so long. I think the key, though, is to make sure that you don't ask a question you don't want the answer to. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. You need to be able to kind of take it on the chin and actually be okay with things that you don't necessarily want to see. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to show, you said this, we did this, and to do it, and to do it as a partnership. And I think that that, um, that breaking down of silos 
helps to encourage creativity as well. Mm. So we talk about creativity being one of the most important things in business, and yet quite often we're you know in sort of consensus kind of meetings where it's all about kind of like who shouts the loudest rather than as you said unlocking it from you know people who have that but they're just afraid to speak up and i find that um mm-hmm. it's just so much potential that kind of goes unnoticed if only we were able to feel that safety and to be able to um to speak up talking about that i mean one of the things i ask women predominantly is like how has being female affected you in business or do you feel like it hasn't affected you at all? Um, so I'm a woman of certain age. Um, I'll be, you know, I'll be quite frank that it is, has been difficult. And um, even in the 2020, you know, even in 2019 and 2020, I've been in meetings where it was tough for me to be heard just because I was a woman and I've been, I have a huge amount of experience and you would think a lot of gravitas that would allow me, um, allow me to speak. But the reality is that the, you know, this isn't um, one person, this isn't one organization, it's a structural hierarchy, you know, it's the patriarchy and it is, you know, a white privileged woman actually has more ability to speak than somebody from, not from the dominant culture. Um, and so it actually is, has been one of the reasons that I was interested in pursuing the work of Equip, um, because I think that everyone's born the same, but we don't get to start at the same place, Mm -hmm. and that's not right. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to change that starting in the workplace. Mm. I want to hear some of the more specific stories, if you're wanting to share them. I mean, any kind of meetings where you felt being sidelined or not heard or, yeah, just an experience where you felt this was not right. So I think that there are, you know, there are lots of examples that could, um, that I could give. I believe that if you looked at most women's performance appraisals, if they've ever been in a big corporate culture, um, it's really uncanny how um, the themes of the subjective um, characteristics that are, um, that are put forward for women's performance are pretty um, similar. So there's lots of you react emotionally or um, you um, speak up too much or you ask too many questions or you might be too aggressive. Um, So those are things that you don't really see in when you read um, a, a man's performance appraisal. Um, And so that makes it more difficult Mm -hmm. and I've, to get ahead and to become a leader. And I've certainly have had all of those things um, on my performance appraisals. But then when a woman becomes a leader, um, and I would use Anna Wintour as as a good example, um, there are all these characteristics that got get put on a person whether they are true or not just whether they have them or not whether mm-hmm. they have them or not now um and as someone that i worked with on the cfda fashion fund when i was running ebay fashion and she is warm she is kind-hearted she is a business person and makes important strategic decisions every day but there are a collection of designers photographers um journalists who rely on her to give them good advice, who she looks out for, and whose best interest that she has in, in, in heart. She has a really warm heart, and that comes through in everything that she does. But you never hear about that. Mm. You, know, you never hear about that as part of who she is, because we have this caricature version um, of Anna with the sunglasses, mm. um, and that doesn't really speak to who she is. And so I think she's an extreme example, but I think it's... It's fair nonetheless that we um, we make women into these caricatures of um, a, a strong female leader rather than allowing them to just be human. Yes. And this is really unfortunate because we just don't have enough of the role models to have. So the few that, that are out there, get, as you said, get caricaturized, you know, assign qualities that are not necessarily theirs or negative qualities that are not really kind of, you know, that 
admirable. But even if they're not, then, you know, being a leader, you know, you're having to make tough decisions and having to be tough sometimes. But, you know, when the positive are not being celebrated, then that doesn't really kind of speak to us either. And one of the things I feel really passionate about is, you know, ensuring that we have enough role models. I mean, we talk about this a lot. It's like, if you can't see her, you can't be her. And that's just so important. But I think just talking about Anna Wintour, I think there's been a change in the perception of her because of social media and her taking somewhat control over the perception of her that you kind of get a glimpse a little bit of what she's like rather than how other people describe her, but coming a little bit from, you know, some of the videos that she does for, for Vogue. But but you're right. I mean, this kind of villainizing women sometimes and I have a very hard time listening to those things because it's just, it's not right and it's not fair. But um, how can, how you know, what do you think could be done about that? Well, I think that there, there are definitely organizations that are trying to um, help. Obviously, that's one of the things that Equip is trying to do. Um, Retail Week's Be Inspired program, which Charlotte Hardy, who has since moved on um, to other things, which she started and which the, the organization continues on with supporting um, the future women leaders. And they have a, a leadership academy that helps women to um, learn what they need to learn in order to survive in the, in the, the world of um, the top echelons in an organization. Um, there are more and more mentoring programs and there's the acknowledgement out there. You know, we are ta- we're actually talking about it, which I think is the first step um, because up until the last few years, it wasn't even something mm-hmm. that we talked about. We talked about the glass ceiling and, and that was it. Um, there's also the work that's being done, particularly for women of color, where they talk about the concrete ceiling, that it's even harder to to break through than the glass ceiling and finding ways to support those women as well. Mm. Talking about survival, I'd love to hear your opinion on how actually the pandemic has shaped you as a leader and what's the repercussions of what we've just gone through Mm -hmm. collectively and the trauma that we have faced. Like what? You know, how, well, first of all, how has it shaped you? And secondly, you know, where is the world heading mm-hmm. after this? Yeah, so that's a big question. Mm. Um, I I have to say that I at the first three months, the plan was to do to ace pandemic, and I tried to do it well. The reality was that it was very difficult for me. And living in central London, I really needed to be in nature, and I wasn't in nature. Mm. Um, and so finding a way to make sure that I got green space was important. Um, but I think... As, as horrible it was, and the loss of life is absolutely astounding um, and something that we're all going to obviously live with, I think everyone took a pause. And I see us t- having taken that pause and coming out of that. Um, and the number of conversations that I have with people who look at life differently, mm-hmm. who look at the work that they want to do differently, who look at where they want to live, how they want to spend their time, who they want to spend their time with, how much busyness they want to fill up their lives with. It's really remarkable. The number of people who are willing to talk about um, climate change Mm -hmm. or racism and how to eradicate either now rather than in the before times is incredible to me. And so that actually gives me hope Mm -hmm. in spite of it all. So I'm, I'm actually feeling hopeful right now. Things kind of when I'm discussing is like, is it going to stay or is it just a moment where we've, you know, faced something really difficult and uncertain and, you know, kind of things that have been always there, but it's given that extra push to actually focus on? Is that going to stay? I think that there is going to, I think there's a continuum Mm -hmm. and people are making more life changes, important life changes right now um, than they have in decades. Mm -hmm. And I think that for those people, it's going to stay. For others, there is a certain amount of safety in getting back to how it was the before times, whatever normal was for them. And I, I think that you will see that as well. I certainly see a shift in how people or at least my circle and kind of my connections and who I speak to, that there is definitely this big monumental shift in thinking and what's Im- reassessing what's important in your life and how you want to live for sure. I think actually talking about the being busy part, 
Like for me, that's something that happened when I've realized that th I was doing too much when my mother passed away. And that was like my mm -hmm. natural way of dealing with things. And every now and then, then when kind of crisis situations happen, that's exactly what I fall back on. This kind of like almost like a workaholism where you're just, you know, kind of on this treadmill, running, running, trying to kind of control this situation that is uncontrollable. So you're trying to kind of maintain some kind of equilibrium with the things that you can control because you can't control the bigger ones, for example, like what happens in the world. And I wonder how that's going to shape the world of work. And I wonder, you know, what kind of interesting insights that you will be getting from, from Equip with regards to that. I mean, anything that you can share? Well, I can't say anything definit definitively at the moment, but I can say that um, companies that I never thought would be having the conversations about how do we make this a more anti-racist place to work? How do we make this organization more welcoming to women? Mm -hmm. um, how do we make this more able to be a place where people who are historically underrepresented can thrive? Mm -hmm. um, companies that I never thought would be having those conversations are now. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the reasons that I'm quite optimistic about mm -hmm. things. And I think you're right that having control is important. And that's why we put a semblance of control and in, in, in particularly in times of chaos. Um, but there are things that individuals can do to make the world a different place. Just mm. look at you, look at me. Mm. You know, we're trying. What can we do as individuals? Like, what do you think we could be doing now to make small changes to, like, our work life and our day-to-day -day life? So for, for me, the most important thing is to remember who, how do I make sure not to center myself and think about who else is out there? How do I not make my white privileged woman the center of the universe and rather think about the people who are different from me and might not have the advantages of me? And so thinking about who, who's not at the table, I think is an, a really important component of how we move businesses forward. Mm. I love that, like who's not at the table? And it's so easy to not think about that because we're just so kind of in our day to day and, you know, doing things the way that they have always been done. And I hope that this is a moment to pause and to actually think, OK, what what else could we be doing and how how is everyone else being affected and to kind of bring the people to the table? I think that's really essential. Well, what three pieces of advice would you give your younger self, like looking kind of back now and you know thinking of your kind of journey what would those three pieces of advice be um first one is never take a job you know you can do you know you should <laughs> always have this pit in your stomach thinking oh my god holy cow how am i ever going to do that that almost like shaking a butterflies as you open the door for the first day because that's really how you grow mm -hmm. and you know, i'm doing that even today in, in my latest in, um venture because it's all brand new to me so that's one. Um, a second is there is no one playbook. So there isn't one way to do things. And so listening to lots of people, getting lots of ideas, and then with a set of principles for how you make decisions, coming up with, with the right strategy is important. But recognizing that there isn't one playbook and, and doing a lot of listening. Um, and third would probably be living you know, set out what your principles are in a company, in an organization, and as you individually, and make sure that you're living living by those, because that's how you lead with your heart. The fact that you shouldn't take a job that you can't, like, that you can do, I think that's just such a, a great way of looking at it, and particularly for women who, you know, there's studies to show that, you know, mm -hmm. you will only really even apply for roles where you are more than like 80 or 90 percent qualified. And actually what you're saying is like, forget about that, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, and just go for something that you you know, you still can't do, but you're going to be sort of stepping up and, and doing that and kind of like that pit in your stomach. Um, I love that. I think that's just such a... Figuring out mm. that your transferable skills are really there and that you're going to lean into them. It's amazing. The things that I learned in fashion that I've put into all different kinds of business, um, it's really helped me. And, and I had to get out of my comfort zone in order to figure that out. Yeah. So I encourage people to do that. I think there is something about 
going out of your comfort zone because if you're always doing things that are safe, then you're not growing, you're not learning, you're not experimenting, which is really where amazing things happen because we, we all don't know what the future holds. We don't know whether one thing will work out. We can make theories and predictions, but until you actually do it, you don't really know. And I think if you're always doing things in the same way, you don't get those amazing opportunities to learn. And the same thing in careers and when you're kind of stepping into something and, you know, that feeling of, you know, being a little bit out of your depth, that can be extremely motivating. Um, as long as it's not something that just like chronically becomes that and kind of eats away at you. But that's a whole nother conversation. Um, well, one question I really love asking is the impossibility question, which is what seems impossible to you now, but if it were to happen, will change the course of your life or your business? That's an unbelievably interesting question. I would say, say that if if organiza any kind of organization um, could take on the mantle of being a learning organization, not just l individuals learning, but the organization itself, living, breathing organizations to learn, um, then they would be interested and um, really eager to find out what are the ways that they can improve structurally in order to make for a thriving workplace. And that, to me, would unlock huge, huge value for each company that did it. Um, and obviously, I'd want to help that with Equip um, to make that happen as well. Where's, um, thank you, Miriam. And where can people find you? What's the best way to reach out to you? Um, so LinkedIn and Twitter are the probably the two places. I'm on Insta as well, but I'm mostly lurking and watching pretty pictures. I don't do a lot there. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for coming, thank Miriam. You. And thank wonderful you. to learn a little bit more about you and your story. And just wonderful to have you here. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. I hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world. Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.